Um, yeah, uh, you know, we have a few people from our, our film team who are in the audience. Could you just stand up? It's, it's, thank you, Jamie. And Jamie, our editor. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, we have a few people from the film here as well. Um, Anya and Fred, we'd like to come down. And I think, I think Lily is here too. There's Carol Boger. Carol. Julia. And, um, and quite frankly, the star of the show, Ari, is here. Yes. One of the best timing babies in the world. Uh, thank you, Ari. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes? I was curious to know how large the ET staff is. I mean, we highlighted four here. Is that all there is? No, there are two more uh, members, actually three more members now in the uh, E-team. Uh, when the film started, uh, it was that was the E-team. But uh, just to be very clear, Human Rights Watch is obviously much, much bigger. Uh, we are 400 staff, and uh, about 100, 150 of those are researchers who do work on the ground in many different countries on many different issues. So the E-Team is a small part of Human Rights Watch, but what you saw on the, well, on the screen was basically the E-Team the way it was. Now it's slightly bigger. Yeah. Uh, great job, Ross and Katie. Um, can you guys talk about how Human Rights Watch is funded? The question, the question is, how is Human Rights Watch funded? Carol. I guess that's a Carol question. <laughs> I'm the money person. Um, we're funded entirely by um, private money. We, we can't take any money from any government because we have to remain independent of them all. Uh, we have a budget of 70 million U.S. annually. Um, so that comes about two-thirds from individuals and about one-third from foundations. About 65% of our funding is from the U.S. and the rest from outside the United States. Um, yeah. I'd just like to say one thing. Um, Peter can't be here tonight. He's in the Central African Republic. Um, there's some serious uh, problems going on there now, but he, he says hello. So. <laughs> Brigal, thank you all. I mean, the, the courage is remarkable, uh, and that you're a family. Is, uh, to, the, to the filmmakers, the fact that you made these people so human um, really impacts the story so much for me. My question is to both of you and to Fred. When there's abuses on both sides, even when, one, when the abuses are much more on one side than the other, but there are still abuses, and we hear in, about in Syria in particular that the trouble with the rebels, that they're fighting with each other and they do some of the same tactics but do not have the same resources, how do you walk through that, keep your objectivity in, in right when the, peop, the bodies are in front of you? So the question is when, when abuses happen on both sides, how do you keep that objectivity and how do you, how do you walk that line, basically? Oh, well, that's an excellent question. Thank you. I mean, I think that the emergencies work is different from other human rights work in, in two ways. You know, one is the physical security that is shown in the film. And the other is what you mentioned, that is that we're not talking about one party, one government or one, we're talking about two or in the Syria case now, multiple parties, right, because the opposition is so fractured. And that makes the work much more difficult. Um, and I think, you know, in the end of the day, it's the methodology that allows us to do the work and will apply it to whatever side is committing abuses. And that means, you know, multiple interviews, that means cross-checking facts, it means visiting the site, it means collecting documents to uh, uh, complete the story. And we'll do that, you know, whoever is the, the, vi the perpetrator or the victim. And, um, you know, I think uh, uh, in the end of the day, our service is to the civilians. You know, we're not going to take a position on one side or the other. And if we think that our work or our intervention um, is going to help to protect them from whoever is threatening them, then we'll do it. And to the filmmakers, the same question. How did you walk through the, the contradictions on both sides of, of the horror? 
I mean, it's a similar thing. How did we walk through the contradictions on both sides of the heart? You know, our job, similar to your job, is, is to tell a story. You know, I, I go in, and Katie, we go in without judgment, and we just try to show what's happening. And that's our job. Um, with Fred and Anya and Ula and Peter, and Danya, you know, we're also just trying to show these incredible characters and also just get to know them. You know, for us, they, we spent many nights on their couches in their apartments um, and we really connected with them and created this bond. So for us, you know, we're just sh trying to tell the story. And whatever that story is, that's where we go. Thank you. It's an interesting question. Well, I can answer from the Human Rights Watch side. It, it, was a, it was a debate for us internally. Why would we do this, actually? You know, why? It's a risk to let somebody in, you know? And um, I think less skilled filmmakers could have made a crappy movie. And, <laughs> seriously. And uh, could have, sen you know, really sensationalized it. Or We did have other documentarians come and pitch us and they just didn't feel like the right people and we knew their work because we have a film festival also in London and in New York and their films have played in our festival so you know they're known quantities these two <laughs> and we could tell from the sensitivity of their previous work that they were going to do a good job but even having said that it was still kind of a risk <laughs> and um, we, we feel it paid off. I think this really does represent the work of Human Rights Watch quite accurately. But it, it wasn't, I mean, they wanted to follow the emergencies team regardless of what war was going on. It, it, it wasn't like we knew, right? Yeah. I can't remember the timing now. But. I mean, we, we had, uh, Katie sent me the initial email that um, was between us. Um, it was dated, I think, September 2007. And so we tried to get funding for a couple of years, and it was tough to get funding. Um, and a lot of documentaries depend on when funding comes in, especially Verite documentaries that are following the story as they progress. So if we had gotten funding eight months, nine months, a year earlier, this would have been much more a film about Libya and, um, and, how, and, and Peter and Fred and their journey through Libya. And it probably would have taken a little bit of Anya and Ule as they started their journey to Syria. But so in a weird way, it was, a lot of it was dependent on when that funding started to trickle in. And I say trickle. trickle. <laughs> and it was so great. It was so great that Ari got born. Because it was it, great that Ari got born. It was so great on so many levels that Ari got born, but also cinematically. Because there's no closure to the war on Syria. <laughs> and, it's, it, and I just want to thank Marilyn Ness, our producer. Come here, please. Um, you know, producers are not always thanked as much as they should be. <laughs> yes, and uh, without Marilyn, this film would not be the film it is. Um, she made me go to a lot of these places, and a lot of us go to these places when we really didn't want to. I said, no, you're getting on a goddamn plane, go. Can I say one thing? Just to add, I mean, uh, Carol mentioned the concerns that we had as an organization. You know, do we let someone inside to show the warts and all? Uh, for me, I, I had another, con an additional consideration. Um, which is, a, you know, a camera changes the environment, you know, it's another creature in the room. And uh, it could affect our work, maybe we'll feel self-conscious, also, you know, security concerns of the people we're interviewing and how will it impact our ability to do the job. And I think there were two things that made it um, much, you know, not a problem, actually, two things that made it less of a factor. I mean, the one is that these guys are good, you know. And, uh, I mean, actually, I was only in the field with Ross, um, there were some other camera people. Rachel Beth Anderson is probably uh, not here tonight, I don't think. Yeah, she was. Uh, but did a lot of the Syria work. And, um, you know, after a while, you just forget they're in the room or in the, in the place. And so that's a real, you know, that's a real uh, tribute to, to their skills. Um, and then, of course, is just, I thought, I think both of the conflicts, both Syria and Libya, were well suited to this because they were dynamic ongoing environments, so we weren't worried about, you know, some of our investigations are sensitive sources, just being there is tricky, a 
camera would be impossible. But in these cases, people were eager and excited to, to, to talk, and I, I didn't feel like the camera uh, impacted that. Um, obviously, there are still atrocities going on all around the world. Uh, Syria conflict continues, and there's what happened a week ago in the Ukraine. Uh, where, do you, where are you guys focused now, and where do you see yourself starting to think about investigating in the future? Yeah. Well, so I think uh, Syria continues to be uh, high up on our agenda, and um, I was back there in, in, in December, um, so we will definitely continue working on Syria and supporting our Middle East and North Africa division. Um, as uh, Ross mentioned, uh, Peter, the fourth member, is now in the Central African Republic, and he's been there several times since, since the um, development started there. Um, I'm, I'm probably off to South Sudan in a couple of weeks. You mentioned Ukraine, that's something that we're keeping a close eye on, so um, unfortunately it doesn't seem that we will be out of work in the, in the near future, but those are some of the um, it, sort of situations that we're following very closely right now. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for your courage and for the extraordinary work that you do. So I'd really like to say thank you. Uh, and congratulate the filmmakers on a beautiful film. Thank you. Uh, my question is, do you worry at all that the attention and visibility that you'll gain from this great film might in some way impede your ability to do your work in the future, or that you might be somehow targeted because you threaten a lot of very serious and bad guys out there? Excellent question, and obviously something that we uh, thought a lot about. I think the ultimate decision was that for our team in particular, we actually have people at Human Rights Watch who have very little visibility, especially people who work in closed countries or who are nationals of the countries that they, where they work. For our team, um, we actually do quite a few sort of undercover mission. I don't like the word, but that's what they are. But honestly speaking, we are in the media so much, um, you know, Googling our names uh, would let the authorities know immediately who we are. So I think we're relying not so much on the fact that our faces or names are not recognizable, but on the fact that the authorities are lazy enough to check. And I can assure you they are. Basically, uh, from what we know, there is like a Google guy in maybe some of the embassies when we apply for visas. And if we're lucky and the Google guy is not there, um, there's a chance we'll get our visas and get in. I'm, it's, 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 it's a real story. It's not, uh, I'm not making it up. I, I just want to say one thing to your first point. Um, I'm, not, this is, I'm not trying to uh, give a, a sort of faux modesty, because um, we're obviously really you know, grateful to um, be recognized. Human rights activists don't get to you know, be uh, thanked all that often. Um, but um, uh, but I, honestly, I've been wanting to say this the, the whole couple of weeks, which uh, week, this whole week, uh, it feels like a, exactly, um, which is you know for me you know the real heroes are not the people who can be honored you know but the, the all of these activists around the world who face incredible risk and persecution arrest imprisonment and you know even their lives you know you saw uh, Mahmoud and Mohammed you know amazing people and you know we get to go back right we go back to Paris or Berlin or New York or whatever and have our beers and coffees uh, and these people are are stuck there you know. Um, so for me, it's, it's something that, that motivates me a great deal to see the, uh, their, their commitment. And I, I wonder all the time, it's something I ask myself a lot, you know, if I were in that situation with my family there, you know, would, I, uh, would I do that? And you know, I'm not so sure I would. Maybe 
Well, this is highly classified information. <laughs> um, uh, people come to Human Rights Watch with very different backgrounds. Uh, some of us are lawyers, some are journalists, some have uh, regional expertise. Uh, usually people come to Human Rights Watch with quite significant experience, uh, including field experience if they're field researchers. And then um, they uh, undergo a pretty intense seven-day uh, training, orientation training, where we make sure that uh, they are familiar with the mandate methodology, uh, security, Ulen does specifically uh, security training. People who work in war zones uh, or other hostile environment situations were sent to uh, more um, specialized security trainings to make sure that they know how to operate in these situations. And also everybody uh, who starts at Human Rights Watch initially is mentored by uh, a more senior researcher or a director, um, including on their first mission, so that um, we make sure that the, uh, we really put um, a lot, a lot of attention to uh, the content of our investigations, because as you can see, they get cited, and you know we, we have to swear by every word that gets into our reports, but also making sure that people are safe. Not only they know what they're doing, but that they're also safe in the field, and that's, uh, well, Ulla's uh, biggest nightmare, uh, day, day and nightmare, uh, but it's uh, something we pay a lot of attention to. I just wanted to add, I, I hope this film puts two myths about the human rights movement to rest. One is that, uh, we're, that we're amateurs or volunteers. This is, a, this is actually a, this is a profession, and these are people who are trained professionally to do this. And Human Rights Watch doesn't rely on people who aren't trained professionally to do it. And I, I think, you know, I'm 52 years old, so when I was in college, you couldn't study human rights, and, you know, there's an academic discipline now around this, and there's a way to be trained in this field. And I think the other myth about human rights activists is that we're naive. And I think that this film, I hope, has shown you that, you know, we do really come face to face with the worst things that humanity can do. We don't have any illusions about making the world perfect or walking sunny-eyed into, you know, into the future. It's not about that. We're, we're, we believe the world can be made better than it is, uh, but we know pretty well how evil it consistently is. Thanks for a wonderful film. My, my question is, you say you're not naive, but I just am having a hard time getting my head around this idea that that you can make a film like this and go into some of these regions that are known for thuggery, their dictatorship, and not have a policy within your organization to go and profile of people who are operatives who are going into the country. That's the first thing. I, I just wonder if you have any policy around that, where you would lower the, the field missions of people who have been exposed in this way. The second question is kind of off the wall. In North Korea, are, 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 you, are, are we on the, are you, you know, is, are, do you have operatives in North Korea? Operatives, I like that. <laughs> So we have many different types of staff at Human Rights Watch and, and in some places, as Anya mentioned, we do have staff who keep a much, much lower profile. Um, the part of the reason why I think we are successful when we are successful is because we're able to bring that personal experience with us when we speak to journalists and when we speak to policy makers. So it is incredibly impactful when we can go up and meet with a foreign minister or a prime minister and, and tell them, listen, uh, forget what, what you heard, I was just in Syria last week. And it's also incredibly impactful to do that with journalists. So th there's always that tension. Um, yes, um, to some extent maybe it would have been to be on the extra safe side. Uh, we could have kept all, all our researchers in, in secret and, and let others do the job. But in, in order to really be effective, we have to be out there and we have to provide that personal um, testimony. And sometimes it backfires. 
Um, Anya, when we worked on the Sri Lanka uh, armed <laughs> conflict uh, a couple of years ago, um, a little bit like you saw in the Syria situation, we were able to get into a government-controlled area, into basically the military area where there was military operations. Uh, we worked there, we collected very powerful evidence, and when we came out, we decided, okay, there were two of us, one of us should go public and do exactly that to tell the journalists and testify before Congress and say, we were just there, this is what's going on, while the other one kept a more, much lower profile. Um, for whatever reason, they decided that Anya was best suited to be on TV. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so she did that job, and as a result, she would, was declared persona non grata in Sri Lanka and was not able to go back. But I was able to go back uh, nine times later on, on vacation um, because I had not done that public public job, so so we try to adjust that uh, accordingly. But but to be impactful, we have to be out there and, and tell the stories. Um, uh, and your second question was on North Korea. Yeah. What do you do in a regime like that where they're very buttoned down and it's very regimented? So there are a couple of countries in the world where we're not able, or where we, based on a security assessment, do not go to. North Korea is one of them. We probably could get a person in there, um, but, but we feel that it's too dangerous. Iran is another country where we could get a person in there if we wanted to, but we also know that if they were discovered, um, the Iranian government is uh, likely to put that person away for, for quite a long time. And in these situations, it is uh, the, the method that we operate is to really speak with uh, refugee populations. Uh, we go and conduct dozens, hundreds of interviews with people who have just come out of those countries, corroborate using the same methodology, using satellite imagery, using photos and videos as well to corroborate their testimony and base our findings on that. So, so, um, so basically we, we have to adjust our methodology a little bit according to the situation, um, but it all comes back to gathering the evidence and corroborating it. And we have time for one more question. So, as a mother, what about as a father? <laughs> I mean, come on. No, actually, I, I will say just a couple things that over the course of the making of this film, uh, both of the directors separately had babies. Fred had a baby. They had a baby. Peter had a baby. We all had a lot of babies. Um, and, um, you know, it is... It's, it's, it is tough to go back and forth, but Anya, I will give this to you. And before we leave, though, I just want to thank you all. It's, it's pretty late, and most of you have stayed here, so I, we all really want to thank you for, for you know, staying, the, staying here and listening to us, and uh, it's late. Sorry, what was the question? What's the question? Oh, take him out. Um, um, no. 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 No, you're not, you're not going to change because you're a mom. The question was... No, I understand. No, I'm not going to quit my job, uh, just like many of my colleagues at Human Rights Watch. Uh, Human Rights Watch is a very good environment uh, for raising a family, for being a mother. Uh, very supportive and very flexible, which is great. Um, there are lots of other women out there, both who do uh, equally or much more uh, risky jobs, who do not go to war zones, but who uh, work just by your side, uh, as well as uh, lots of women in these war zones who are mothers and who subject themselves daily to the kind of risks that what we do is incomparable to. And finally, I think one of my motivations is uh, our oldest son, Dana, whom you saw in the movie. Um, he's now 14. And... Uh, he sometimes complains that I don't make him uh, lunch every day. Uh, he was very happy having me on maternity leave for now. But uh, at the same time, he would not hesitate to say that his parents are really cool. So when your 14-year-old thinks that you're cool, I think that gives you a very good incentive to continue doing what you're doing and raising your kids knowing that their parents are doing something meaningful. What about your parents? Once again, thank you so much for uh, staying late. Thank you. Please remember to vote.